we now move on. Um, in Focus 7, we encounter quantum mechanics. Uh, so it's a, a whole new avenue of understanding. Um, people realized in the thought in the 19th century that Newton had it right. And, but of course, classical mechanics was swept away at the end of the 19th century by experiments. And in their place arose quantum mechanics. We think we've got it right with quantum mechanics. But in 50 years time, who knows, we might be as laughable at as um, the, the Victorians were. Anyway, this particular focus introduces you to the divergence of classical mechanics from, of quantum mechanics from classical mechanics. As soon as people started to make um, detailed measurements, in particular, measurements of the distribution of radiation from a hot body, black body radiation, which um, happily was resolved in the year 1900 by Planck. So we've, all, we've got a very neat, almost quantized starting point for the emergence of, of, of quantum theory. Uh, black body radiation could only be explained quantum mechanically. Uh, and then um, there was the realization, of course, the, one of the core realizations of quantum theory is that energy can be transferred from one system to another only in discrete packets in quanta. One, one leg on which quantum theory um, stands. Then, of course, um, yeah, there was the um, photoelectric effect. Uh, where people realized that what they had considered to be waves, electromagnetic radiation, was in fact corpuscular, and perhaps corpuscular as well as waves. Uh, and people start also discovered that the electron, which had been discovered in 1897, which was thought to be a particle, could be diffracted and therefore had the property of waves. And so there emerged onto the intellectual landscape the realization that waves and particles had blended together. We'd encountered the world of duality, of wave-particle duality. And what quantum mechanics had to do was to um, establish a, a mechanics, a way of calculating, which took into account wave-particle duality. And the, um, the principal steps were made in the 1920s by people like um, Erwin Schrödinger and Werner Heisenberg and Paul Dirac. And um, I like to think of um, Schrödinger being up a mountain with his mistress and Heisenberg being on an island in isolation, and Dirac being in a world of his own, um, hardly talking to anyone, um, as these three founders of, um, of, of, of quantum mechanics. And what Schrodinger did, effectively we'll confine ourselves principally with Schrodinger's approach to quantum mechanics, was to introduce the wave, um, the wave function. And the wave function is a mathematical entity an ex an equ an, the, which contains all the dynamical information about the system. It contains where the particle can be found. It contains its linear momentum. It contains any property of the system that you care to ask of it. So it is the central carrier of information in quantum mechanics. And the, the Schrodinger equation um, uh, really enables you to find the, um, the, the wave function for any specified potential energy of the system. And um, 
the realization that really came from Schrodinger's work is that not all solutions are acceptable because wave functions have to satisfy certain conditions. And it's the imposition of those conditions which rules out some of the wave functions and therefore some of the corresponding energies and therefore accounts for the existence of quantization. And the quantization depends upon the mechanical specification of the system, like the, the force constant of a spring or the length of a box in which the particle is confined. Then, of course, you need to know how to get the, way, the information out of the wave function. You've got the wave function, sometimes a very simple expression, sometimes horrendously complicated. But the dynamical information is in the wave function. And what you've got to do is to dig it out. And that leads to the realization that what you need is um, an operator corresponding to the observable of interest, which when you apply that operator to the wave function, it pops out the result of a measurement of that property. And so one of the, the topics that we have following the introduction of the wave function is the property of mathematical operators. And the mathematical operators are uh, all very simple, really, I mean, because they're built from two well-defined operations. Um, the, the operation of uh, finding out where a particle is along the x-axis is simply multiplication by the value of x. The operator for finding out what the linear momentum is along the x-axis is simply differentiate the wave function with respect to x. So and out of it comes either the position of the particle or the, um, or the um, linear momentum. The trouble is, with, when, when you're dealing with operators, it turns out that um, you can't always extract um, explicit information about all of them simultaneously. And this leads to the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which most people think of as a great confuser of the world and a denier of information. I actually like to think of it as a great clarifier because old-fashioned people like Newton and Einstein and Lagrange and all the people who developed classical mechanics took it as certain that to specify the state of a, of a particle, you had to specify where it was and how fast it was going. What quantum theory uh, did through the uncertainty principle was to clarify. What it said was, look, discuss the world, if you like, in terms of positions. Or if you prefer, discuss the world in terms of linear momenta. Don't try both at once. You get very simple description in terms of positions. You get very simple description in terms of linear momenta. It's only when you, like starting a sentence in English and ending in Latin or something, that if you're trying to mix the two together, that you get into confusion. So think of the uncertainty principle as a clarifier, telling you think one way or think the other way, but don't try to think like Newton thought. Um, OK, we've got all the properties of operators, which, aren't, which are very interesting, and they, they really do tell you a lot about the kind of operators that can exist to represent observables, and which of them can be, un, can be defined simultaneously, and so on. And then we move on to um, the application of the Schrodinger equation, the wave function, and these operators, to the discussion of the three fundamental types of motion. The first being translation, motion in a straight line. And everyone starts with either a free particle, or which is not quantized, or a particle in a box, which really does teach you a great deal about the role of boundary conditions on establishing uh, the quantum levels of a system. Then 
instead of a, then the, the next topic deals with a modification of a particle in a box, which is instead of having a box that is rectangular, have a box that is parabolic. And now you're in the world of Hooke's law and in the world of the quantum mechanics of vibrational motion. And you get out of it the, um, the energy levels of a harmonic oscillator. Harmonic oscillator is an extraordinarily important object. It shows all sorts of um, wonderful properties. And you can almost anticipate that it might be wonderful by realizing how symmetrical it is. If you think of uh, what the expression for the energy of a harmonic oscillator is, it's got the square of the linear momentum representing the kinetic energy, and it's got the square of the displacement from equilibrium for this parabolic potential. So it's symmetrical in linear momentum and in position. And that symmetry means that it has extraordinary properties. And if you solve, if you've got some sort of theory you've developed and you, it's usually easy to solve it for the harmonic oscillator. And you find the harmonic oscillator algebra occurring in all sorts of funny places, simply because it's so symmetrical. And um, finally, the, um, the quantum mechanics of rotational motion, which introduces the idea that not only is energy quantized, but so too is angular momentum. The momentum of, of a particle either on a ring, simply because the ends of the wave function must match if you go around a circle, or in three dimensions, a particle sliding over the surface of a sphere when you've, it, the wave function must match going around the equator and also over the poles. So you get two quantum numbers. Um, and furthermore, the rotation, the quantization of rotation leads you into an understanding that even orientation is in some sense quantized, that a spinning body can't simply spin in any orientation. If you define an axis, then it can only rotate around a certain number of axes. So all sorts of quanta, quantum behavior emerges in, um, from the Schrodinger equation simply by applying by the boundary conditions to the solutions of the Schrodinger equation. So what this focus has done has really taken you from the realization that you need a new mechanics, which came in 1927, the realization that your central focus is the wave function, which contains all the information you're ever going to get. The realization that to extract it, you need to know about operators and how they work and how they extract that information. And then the three major types of motion, translation, vibration, and rotation. So you now, at this stage, know all you need to do know about the foundations of quantum theory, which then needs to be applied.